Billions of people around the world need aid, but providing the help required isn't as easy as it used to be. Why? Counterterrorism legislation, according to several NGOs, including Norwegian People's Aid. The charity was found guilty of illegally helping terrorists in Palestine and was forced to settle with the U.S. government for more than $2 million. Right now, the U.S. law, called the False Claims Act, stipulates that any NGO that applies for U.S. funding must agree not to provide for groups sanctioned by Washington. That includes Hamas. But how do you help Palestinians in Gaza while avoiding Hamas, who run the place? Well, to discuss this in New York, we're joined by David Abrams. He's the executive director at Zionist Advocacy Center and the lawyer behind the legal campaign against Norwegian People's Aid. In Warrington, Virginia, is Olga Wall. She is an international contracts and grant specialist and a former USAID contracts officer. And with me on set is TRT World producer Obeda Hitto. David, uh, first of all, tell me how much of a victory this was for you that the Norwegian People's Aid had to give the U.S. government $2 million. It's a victory um, mainly because it serves notice on all of the uh, humanitarian NGOs that they, uh, who take U.S. money that they have to be careful not to get enmeshed with uh, organizations that we consider terrorists in America. Um, in terms of when you say, is it a victory for you, of course, my organization received a substantial whistleblower award as a result of the settlement. Okay. And if the reality on the ground is that things are enmeshed and it's hard to avoid groups deemed by the United States and the Israeli government terrorists, it's hard to avoid them while you're actually giving aid to Palestinians in need. Your answer is what? Well, sir, I, I, um, I question your assumption that it, it's hard to avoid that. Uh, for example, in the Norwegian People's Aid case, it turned out that they had um, helped the Iranian government to clear mines. Um, not clearing mines to um, protect villagers from getting hurt, but so that Iran could pump oil. Uh, I would respectfully submit to you that a humanitarian organization doesn't need to get involved in helping anyone pump oil. And, in fact, my research shows that most of these NGOs do seem to avoid, um, do seem to accomplish their mission without uh, giving what we call material support to designated terrorist organizations. Olga so Wall? it seems that okay. a lot of them do, okay. in fact, do it. Okay. So, Olga Wall, is it, is it clear to you that it is easy to avoid spiky groups, if you like, and just get the, get the humanitarian work done? Well, it's not at all uh, black and white like this. Uh, the USAID specifically has very robust regulations in place um, in the countries where there is a, a, a you know, a lot of threat of terrorism or potential associations with terrorists. Um, there are vetting procedures in place um, that go through the U.S. government and local organizations. And the NGOs, just like the contractors, all have to follow those procedures in order to clear as many bad actors as possible before they provide mm -hmm. um, assistance or contracts to those organizations. However, just like you said, um, it is, you know, you, you, if you're working in Palestine, um, you know, how many people do you think are associated with Hamas that runs the place? And um, what is the material support? I think it's, it is a, a question of uh, how much NGOs have to do and where their liability ends, mm -hmm. uh, and at, at which point it becomes cost prohibitive for them to operate in those territories. Okay. Right now, the NGOs spend on average 20 to 30 percent of the funding that they receive on compliance. Right. So, and another 30 percent right. of the administration. Right. So okay. how much right. money actually the that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's an interesting. Let me bring in Obeda here. So we have the False Claims Act, and David's working to get the US government to essentially enforce their own law. Let me ask you, Obeda, based on your experience, especially on the ground, is this something that's easy to do, or will it leave vulnerable people more vulnerable? 
definitely in this situation in Gaza, it's going to be very difficult for anybody. And this is something that has been going on for the last 15 years at the very least. If uh, you recall several years ago, there was the Holy Land Foundation uh, trial, which was a case with similar circumstances where an American NGO was providing aid to people in Palestine or in occupied Palestinian territories. And the, the, the case against them was that they were providing material support to terrorists, including the Hamas terrorist organization, by way of distributing uh, money and funds and other things to people who were related to Hamas members or who were the uh, sons and daughters and children of people uh, who, who had been affiliated with the organization. So in, in Gaza today or in other places where Hamas is existing today or other terrorist organizations, it's going to be very difficult for any aid organization or any international, uh, international institution to determine who is a terrorist and who is not a terrorist. The other issue here is defining what is material support. Uh, I, I, I was reading uh, some information about other work that Mr. Abrams has uh, engaged in, and it, it seems like he hasn't had so much success in convincing the American court system with his argument that violations of this uh, False Claims Act uh, are not actually happening in the way that he is portraying. With the Carter Center, he argued that they were presenting snacks and food and water and drinks to members of Hamas, uh, uh, to members of the Hamas organization at meetings where they were discussing how to uh, deal with the situation in the Middle East and deal with the Palestine-Israel conflict. And this is, uh, the Carter Center is a known NGO that conducts these kinds of meetings and workshops and open sessions where people from different parts of a conflict or different sides of a conflict can come and discuss these situations. And so when they held this meeting, uh, Abrams argues that they were okay. providing uh, material okay, support so let's get, by let's, let's uh, facilitating that okay. meeting. Okay, so David, if you, if you hold a meeting with Hamas, and the reason you're having a meeting with Hamas is because there is a conflict. You, you wouldn't need the meeting if there wasn't a conflict. If you're sitting down with them and you give them potato chips, is that material support? Um, yes, it is, but the material support we're talking about goes a lot further than just handing someone a bottle of water. OK, because there's different terrorist organizations in and around Israel. There's the uh, Hamas, of course, but there's the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And um, these organizations are all, are all illegal. And if you host a meeting um, where these organizations get together, you're essentially harboring terrorists. And all of these organizations, um, to the extent that they are trying to uh, destroy Israel. If David, you get them together and well, you David, let them Jimmy, work Jimmy out Carter their differences, himself met with that, Hamas. Um, that, so, that, I mean, was Jimmy Carter harboring terrorists when he when he met with Khalid Meshal a few years ago? His, I, I respectfully submit that his his organization's in office, office his organization's office in Ramallah was in fact harboring terrorists, um, based David on what Abrams I've seen. And if you argue. allow them to work out their differences. That, re that releases uh, all the more energy mm -hmm. uh, for attacks on okay. Israel. So, David, yeah. I just want to make clear that you might have this position and you might argue that their meeting in Ramallah in 2015 was their uh, act of harboring terrorists and providing them with snacks and the ability to network. All of this might, in your opinion, mean that they were providing material support to terrorism. But the Department of Justice told very clearly uh, about this particular case that you and the Carter Center had a difference of opinion on how to solve problems in the Middle East and that the Carter Center was not engaged in providing material support to terrorism. So it seems like you're using this False Claims Act in, in, in such a way that you can push your own political agenda. And it seems like the Zionist Advocacy Center uh, kind of gives it away. Using such a name like Zionist Advocacy Center might, you know, make you very much uh, biased in that particular okay, situation. Okay, David, David respond. Uh, well, may, I, may I ask David? Okay, yeah, uh, Olga, I, just I'm a second, Olga. David, come in. So, so I'm completely an advocate for Israel, and I've never made any secret of that fact. Um, in the case of the Carter Center, the United States government did disagree with me, and they um, are ultimately the plaintiff in the case. It's their decision whether to go forward with the case, and they decided not to do so. Um, so, in effect, yes, I lost that case. I prevailed in another case. I have many more cases pending. Right. And ultimately, the government in America is going to decide if those cases have merit. Okay. And you tried to seek penalties against Médecins Sans Frontier or Doctors Without Borders as well. I understand you lost that case. I want to bring in Olga. Olga, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, well, I would like to ask David is that if we are not going to draw the uh, line for the material support, um, at the potato chips and water and having meetings and, and negotiating, uh, do you think that Palestine deserves any aid? 
because uh, by that definition, we should not be providing aid to anybody, right? Because if you have a key TAM case, which is what these cases are, the key TAM is a U.S. you know is is a whistleblower uh, law that allows you to bring on a case uh, against the company that is violating. Uh, uh, laws or regulations or terms of their contract with the U.S. government. And as part of that key TAM recovery, you get 20 to 30 percent if you prove in a court of law that or the Justice Department agrees with you that they have that they have, in fact, violated that law. So that's very profitable for you. And it's a very profitable uh, thing to do. It, it is it exists there for a reason. But if we are going to prosecute NGOs for providing any kind of support to beneficiaries in Palestine and not draw the line for and, and not define material support and where those things are excusable, then we should not be providing any aid, correct? David? I, I respectfully disagree with you, ma'am. Um, it's absolutely possible to uh, support the Palestinian Arabs without running afoul of the anti-terrorism certification. And I know this because there's numerous NGOs um, that are operating in Gaza, that are operating in Judea and Samaria, which is commonly known as the West Bank. And uh, I don't have claims against them, and they don't seem to be um, supporting terrorist organizations. So it's possible to do it. Now, it's true that it, there are some costs of compliance. We all in regulated industries have compliance issues, and it's just something that has to be done. Um, the, it, my government in America, we've taken a hard line against terrorism. The United States Supreme Court, in a case called, um, it was the Holder case, they, they de define material support very broadly. And that's the law in America, and that's what NGOs need to comply with, and it seems that most, in fact, do. Olga? So there is, uh, so let me ask you this. If you would like to serve the greater good, and you do agree that the Palestinians deserve aid, do you think that the NGOs that are providing aid uh, should be notified when you have the information that is credible enough to show that they have, they're running afoul with the law? Would you not be better serving the Palestinian beneficiaries by providing that information to the NGOs and only prosecuting them if they do not respond to that information in any way? That's a very interesting question. You know, the, the law here in America requires that um, these cases kept, be kept under seal. So I have five cases pending now, um, which I am not allowed to discuss. I can't say who the defendants are. I can't say what evidence I have against them. And that's the law that I have to comply with. And the, the suggestion you make, that's a very interesting one. And it's one that's worth considering. So I, I'm not sure that that's legal, but I'll, I'll certainly take it under advisement. Okay. Well, well okay. Listen, the... listen, this is I, I, I've really enjoyed this exchange between the two of you. I just want to kind of step back for a second again, come back to Obeda here. Big picture from the perspective of Palestinians living in Gaza and the occupied West Bank. If we look at the zeitgeist, right? So we're seeing whether people agree with David or not, He's winning cases against NGOs such as the Norwegians, right? And we look at the United States, the Trump administration, cutting funds to UNRWA. We see USAID or USAID, whatever you want to call it. We're seeing the, the U.S. downscaling its operations when it, when it comes to USAID in the occupied Palestinian territories. We have UN OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of uh, Humanitarian Affairs, saying that the Israeli government and the United States, making life a little bit difficult uh, working within the occupied territories. For the Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank, what's the message that's being sent to them right now? The message that's being received in Gaza and the West Bank by Palestinians is that there is not enough effort or political will, let's say, to go against the Zionist lobby in the world, whether it be in America or other places, to figure out a way to relieve the suffering of the normal everyday people. There's a, a, a real separation, and you've been to Gaza before, Amran. Uh, you know that there is a real separation between the normal people in Gaza and the, the Hamas terrorist wing, if you will, the armed terrorist wing. They, they are not 
intermingling in such a way that every other person is a Hamas member. There are people who have nothing to do with Hamas living in Gaza. There are people who are from the West Bank, who were deported from the West Bank by Israel living in Gaza. People who have nothing to do with Hamas. People from other political parties. So when you uh, attack or, or, or try and send a message like Mr. Abrams said, that people need to be aware that if they're going to be dealing with uh, terrorist groups, that they're going to be attacked in the legal system, it's going to make people afraid of supporting Palestinian issues. And Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank recognize that. They know that people are afraid to help them. They feel like they are more isolated than before because it's becoming more difficult for aid organizations to get money, to get help, to get services to the people who are in Palestine, especially the Gaza, uh, Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And my further question beyond that, which we don't have the, the scope in this conversation to cover, is how, how does that play out on the ground politically? And might it be uh, a possibly terrible thing? Listen, we're out of time, but I appreciate you all joining us here on the Newsmakers. David Abrams, Olga Wall, and Ubeda Hito. I hope you'll all come back onto the program.